what does finding your voice mean so i think as a and it doesn't mean that you have to be a creative person uh it's in a space of self expression i think the the larger challenges that uh because of so much of digital noise which is in your head and the outside uh what we've got caught up in is uh we're just terrible listeners now it become more about projection uh the temptations are there and you know the vanity is there and we're being judged and you know, the life we live today uh so within that how do you so let's say we come with the creator space uh creator space like what i do with red balloon we basically use visual arts and performance arts as a tool it is really a tool to basically amplify issues which are important to you so if you're coming from let's say a, a student from a privileged space maybe it's about mental health maybe it's about body shaming maybe it's about bullying working in marginalized space children who are young girls young adults they are looking at uh, you know trying to create something around anti trafficking or issues about you know uh, sanitation there are millions of climate so many different issues so what we we do is that you give them the tool that mentorship of 8 10 days or whatever time it is they create that voice then they amplify that so it's not about you finish 10 days or 2 weeks or when you get a certificate you feel good about it you go back to the community or back to your uni or school or whatever it is and that's where you basically start uh, amplifying that so you become the ambassadors to these whatever these issues are so i think you know that's where it is and the the most critical thing is uh, there is no book in school uh, which can teach you empathy Welcome to Unbox with Tanvi, a podcast where we try and have conversations that inspire, uh, try to understand human behavior, unravel some of the things that we as humans do, and we try and do it through conversations with people who've lived unconventional lives, made some bold choices. And today I have with me someone who's actually broken the mold on many, many fronts: a photographer, an artist. He is the founder of Red Balloon, um, an NGO that works with the youth and young people to create social impact and social change. He is a TED speaker, a TEDx speaker, and uh, he is my friend. Please help me welcome Samar Jodha. Hi, Samar. So good to have you. Thank you very much. I am very excited to hear what you said in the beginning. Uh, you know, trying to get into the deeper space rather than whatever professional. T-shirt we wear. So I'm really looking forward to hearing <laughs> what you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. No, but I'm telling you, I think uh, in terms of anyone I speak to, the professional journey um, will be available at some point. I think online it's available, but I think what's important is to understand the motivations behind that journey, the lessons behind that journey, the the growth you've had as a person because of the journey that you've had. You know. But uh, before I start that, I want to tell you, you know, the first time we met was in two thousand, and uh, it was Timeless Books in South Extension. It was a, a, right. a coffee table, like a, a yeah, yeah, bookstore. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we met, and uh, you took a picture of mine. Okay. A black and white picture. I'm flipping through a book, and uh, you took it from outside natural light, and you said, "I'll send it to you." Okay. And many, many, many months later, I got an envelope, which had two printed pictures in it. Yeah, and uh, and that's how I think. Wow. <laughs> you know, it stuck. But I think conscious memory is when uh, you have this project called Red Balloon. I think it wasn't called Red Balloon yeah. back then. Right, right. But you work with children in conflict areas and. You know, That's right. Yeah, so we did that fundraiser. Yeah, fundraiser. I think you were we were auctioning images clicked by these kids. That's right. That's right. But in all of the time that you worked, and you worked a lot in conflict areas, you've studied also all over the world because of your dad's, uh, you know, profession. But you have worked in conflict areas, Afghanistan and uh, many others. Is it? tough on your psyche when you're in those situations or does it make you feel like you're contributing well you know uh, what you see on the face obviously is conflict and disparity and uh, you know just is not served all that stuff uh, i think my deeper reason for these places is uh, it's more about you know your own uh, 
environment you've been brought in, brought up in. Uh, I, I was very privileged uh, that I traveled and lived all over in so many different continents, various international schools and all that stuff. But I also had a very massive failure, which was the academics, which was quite terrible. Uh, according to the Indian standards of how you look or how a parent would look. Considering my father was a PhD in economics, so one would expect that. So my father was the last one who expected that I had to become that's an economist. Very kind, or, you know? yeah, that's, yeah. that's very, very, I think it's just so empowering for a parent to not put yeah, that push burden. Their, yeah. Yeah, that fear, right? Uh -huh. so, uh, so I think uh, for me, this whole space of uh, being marginalized, you know, it was, you know, it was, it started very early in life. The it was failure. It almost first-hand experience of your own. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that kind of also helped me uh, see the marginalized point of view. So it wasn't like I went and studied international studies from JNU or I, you know, I went through whatever. I think it's just personal way of how you look at your life. And when you see, and when I say that, uh, you know, why art should be the voice for people who don't have a voice. Uh, so it's not just about that, oh, these guys don't have any place to say it. I really believe or I like to claim that space uh, that, you know, I came from that area where I didn't have a voice in a conventional way and I created whatever else I could make. So it's, it's not so much about, of course, you know, it, it does impact you. And I worked in Bhopal, I worked in uh, Tanzania with albino kids, I worked in all kinds of places and you see that, you see children especially because as we all know that, uh, you know, they don't really draw their own book and when you see that they go through all this, so I give them a camera and they create a story and they have, everybody has a story and so it's a but little... Just, I'm just thinking about the kid who probably has nothing, you know, you worked with rag pickers and you worked in, in, in areas where they, I think kids have nothing. And when you go in there and you give them this expensive piece of equipment, how empowering that must be for that child that somebody trusts me enough. Yeah, or is it something else? Yeah, no, I think it's uh, the trouble is, uh, again, it's a grown up world, right? Where we don't trust and we're always trying to, how can I get this, whatever, camera for that matter. Uh, I don't think that. The kids have, you know, the excitement is there, of course, you're very right, you get this piece of care and all that. Now, of course, we've gone to digital, it's very different. Uh, but I think for the kids, uh, the, the whole idea of, and I'm talking about the times when I started working where none of the digital noise was there, no phone cameras and all that. So the, most people, the kids were never photographed, forget being photographers. So all of a sudden you have something, you process that film and then they go and look at the print, they go to the assembly of them. These are places where, um, and are, it's a it's a food program, and that's why that school is there. It's under trees. It's under. It's not your conventional schools. Uh, and uh, suddenly they are creating something out of you know the fascination of photography is that uh, anybody can be a photographer. You can't be a painter because you don't even know how to stretch canvas unless you're trained for that. Uh, but the picture making is the easiest, and I think the best thing has happened because of so much of digital. Of course, there's a lot of digital noise and there's a lot of noise. But uh, anybody can be a picture maker, so uh, you know, it, 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 that's the empowerment, definitely. You, you know, on one of your TEDx talks, you spoke about finding your voice. I just, uh, how, what do you think it means in today's world when there is so much noise? Um, you know, I get a lot of DMs on a regular basis where, and I have clients whom I'm coaching. The common thread is everybody's just confused or lost for the lack of a better word. I don't know, is that, has that been your experience when you've traveled all over the world or what does finding your voice mean? So I think as a, and it doesn't mean that you have to be a creative person. Uh, it's in you know, a space of self-expression. And self-expression can be with your child, or it can be with your spouse, or with your workmates. Uh, I think the, the larger challenge is that uh, because of so much of digital noise, which is in your head and the outside, uh, what we've got caught up in is uh, we're just terrible listeners now. They become more about projection. Uh, the temptations are there, and you know the vanity is there, and we are being judged, and you know, the life we live today. Uh, so within that, how do you, so let's say we come with the creative space. Uh, creative space, like what I do with Red Balloon, we 
basically use visual arts and performance arts as a tool not to make you a great filmmaker or a puppeteer or something it is really a tool to uh, basically amplify issues which are important to you so if you're coming from let's say a, a student from a privileged space maybe it's about mental health maybe it's about body shaming maybe it's about bullying working in marginalized space children who are young girls young adults they are looking at uh, you know trying to create something around anti-trafficking or issues about you know uh, sanitation there are millions of climate so many different issues so what we we do is that you give them the tool that mentorship of eight ten days or whatever time it is uh, and they create uh, they they create that voice whatever that may be so you give the tool and the voices whatever the issue is and uh, then they amplify that so it's not about you finish 10 days or two weeks or when you get a certificate you feel good about it you go back to the community or back to your uni or school or whatever it is and that's where you basically start uh, amplifying that so you become the ambassadors to these whatever these issues are so i think you know that's where it is and the the most critical thing is uh, there is no book in school uh, which can teach you empathy and empathy fortunately Creativity is very much about the empathy. So it is non-judgmental. So you can have, you know, 10 people, you can have 10 different ways of looking at it. And you know, that's and there's no build. right or wrong. Yeah. And that gives a huge boost to your your own confidence that you are okay, you are all right, you know. Maybe you are not fitting in that body type, but you know, I do this and nobody's judging me on that. You know? So these are the building blocks basically. You you worked on many projects. One of the projects that, and I don't really want to talk about projects, but how it affected you was uh, the Bhopal gas tragedy. Incidentally, I was in Bhopal at that time. Oh, really? In 84. 84. Yeah, yeah, I was in class 2 or 3. December. And uh, we were on a train back from Agra to Bhopal. We'd gone to uh, my grandparents' house in Agra. And we were on our way back to Bhopal. And I remember reaching Bhopal railway station very early in the morning. We were very young and I don't know what the whole thing was, but we were like my father and a couple of his, you know, people from the regiment were there and we were all just whisked through the railway station and, and it was silent and I thought people are sleeping and it was still, you know, dawn, sun was coming out and we were like quickly hush hush and I said, what happened, what happened? And, you know, everyone saying, oh, shh, quiet, don't talk. And it's only a couple of days later that it unraveled and some of our school teachers came and stayed in our house because the cantonment was protected because of the wind direction or whatever. But uh, when I, uh, I I saw the installation that you had done as well and it affected me in ways that I can't really put into words because as a kid, I had witnessed some version of it. I didn't know the grave, uh, the graveness of it. But uh, how did it affect you? And like, how how does how do circumstances around drive creative right um, output? Yes, yeah. yeah, so, you know, personally, my whole practice has been on any front, including yeah, you've Bhopal. done filmmaking, you've done installation, art, design, you've been to NID, like you've done a whole bunch of things around creativity. Right. Yeah. So you know, the, I look at, I mean, not look at, but I think that over the years, the practice has been really about uh, conflict, mm. and for me, conflict is about this whole urbanization and consumption culture as it's as it arrives in global south how it impacts people's way of life so whether i worked in northeast with the community on capacity building and you know working with uh, sustainability uh you know setting up education program helping build monastery you know, set up a yeah, you work with project. an almost extinct yeah, uh, so buddhist a, yeah, drive, tribe right, yeah. yeah so you can see that because there are mines in that area so that's the conflict the development model of last whatever 30, 40, 50 years of let's say this region or this part of the world, you know, it, it's the guys who are, who don't have the voice other. So that's the conflict there. Uh, or let's say uh, you talk about urban disaster, corporate irresponsibility. Bhopal is an example of that, where you know you uh, just turn your back on them. So yeah, so we created that 40 foot long. Uh, uh, in fact, it's a it's a it's a train journey, Correct, and yeah. it's a temperature control. It's the winter of that December, uh, and it's traveled. So it's been through. You know, London Olympics when it was yeah. uh, Dow Chemical was uh, sponsoring it, and but they uh, didn't take responsibility so for it. They want obviously they don't engage. They own Union Carbide, but there is still there is enough space for you to express it. And, you know, it wasn't anti-Olympics. It was about that you know how corporates show this great picture of themselves, but what the other dirt which hangs with them. And I think if you come from a 
creative space in a country like developing country like India, I think it's really important for uh, at least for myself as an artist that uh, my practice can go beyond this Just, beauty, you know, yeah. because uh, well, there's a lot of beauty, of course, is also required. You cannot live in a dark container. Uh, but I just feel that, so that's really what all the work is. So including teaching kids, for example, it's again conflict. It's about uh, places where you don't have that space to, to self-express. Uh, but you said uh, that, you know, you can't ha you live in a dark box, you need beauty. And you did a lot of work in beauty as well, fashion and automobiles and all the glamorous, fancy stuff. Right. Uh, but you say often that it, you get bored very quickly. Yeah, I think you get jaded, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the big uh, trouble with uh, creativity, at least for myself, is that once you've figured out something, mm -hmm. then it becomes a formula you keep spitting. Yeah, you know? I know what you right? mean. I so, know exactly it's, it's what like you mean. what you've done. You, you moved from so many different places. Yeah. You could have stuck to that and you could have been the biggest thing in the world, right? Yeah. In your world or whatever. Uh, so I find that uh, when I was in my 20s, you know, I started working on fashion because I came from the West, so they thought I should fashion, which I didn't, but I did shoot once I got here. But that led me to more sensible stuff where I work on publishing projects, working on textiles, all that stuff. So, uh, but again, that boredom thing started settling in because like, okay, you've done it. How many books are you going to do? You know, they all become a spine anyway under the next book, which comes on top of that. So, yeah. you know, I was done with that part, started working with NGOs, but started working closely with social sector development agencies and also realized that you're just a tool voicing their agenda basically yeah. so you know so these are all processes which keep changing yeah. uh, and so when we talk about boredom uh, for me boredom was like because i what i believe is that everybody is of course born with that right brain and then we go to school college they inject you with chemistry math all that to activate <laughs> your left brain right uh, but there are a few people who manage to keep that you managed few. because you said you've not studied beyond seventh. Yeah, so officially. I, I mean, you've yeah. done, you've studied yeah, yeah. at NID and done yes, a lot of yeah, these yeah, other yeah. courses. Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, exactly. So, what I'm saying is that if you have managed to save your whatever thinking based on your right brain, you know, on the creative space. Now, if I figure out that, okay, you know, this is how I make this piece of art, this, this ceramic piece. Now, I made it this and then tomorrow I'll send it to I'm successful, my, you know, uh, buyers and investors and the critiques and the galleries, everybody's loving it. And then what, what do I do? Okay, let's make something else. So again, okay, now let's make it bigger. No, no, we got to make it as big as this room. So let but me send it to China thing, but it's and we're going to make thing. that. So, yeah, exactly. So the trouble is that, you know, you end up repeating yourself. Now, it is very easy to say it. Pressures of, you know, money, your, uh, your collectors, all yeah. that stuff comes in. Uh, and if you tell them that, hey, I'm not doing, I'm going to make a table and they'll say, no, no but it's I not want happening the mug, because yeah. they're used to that stuff. So are you prepared to walk away from that cup is the real thing. And I find that uh, when you don't walk away from, if I don't walk away from that, what I'm doing is I might as well. So I always give this example of the, the left brain, some guy was running a cement factory and he has produced, you know, 5,000 bags, 10,000, they'll figure out 100,000 bags. And they're doing great, you know, uh, so you are doing the same thing. So what are you claiming your right brain is so much about creativity? You just have cracked a formula. You might as well be a cement uh, manufacturer. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but it, accept the reality. Yeah, at, yeah. Least, at least be honest. Yeah. So I think uh, for me, when I say uh, boredom, what I mean is that uh, that repeat mode really scares me. And, you know, that me as a person, uh, I can look at it that, oh, you're not committed towards your practice. Okay, I'm not committed towards it. But uh, switching and and the, the key thing is the reason you got into creative space was because it wasn't logical. You're yeah. trying to figure it out that how do I make something which will be out of ceramic? How ceramic made? You know, yeah. how is this cup made when you started off? Yeah. So, you know, your brains are working very differently. Once you figure it out, then it will stop. So when it stops and uh, who are you kidding yourself? I mean, you you know, you repeat more that is right. You know, you've just given me an understanding of some of my life choices. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because um, for the longest time, I, you know, for some time, I think I carried guilt around not having stuck to something long enough. Right. I've jumped many boats. That's right. And uh, my husband always used to laugh. She said, you know, first six months of a new project, she'll argue for the motion. <laughs> and the next six months, she'll argue against the motion. Why I must start something and then why I must stop, stop this. <laughs> 
so i think uh, you've just given me a huge understanding of of um, my motivations yeah so i did a lot of talk shows over the years yeah, sorry exactly in uh, in the early 2000s i had, i used to do a talk show called meri baat it was on doordarshan and it was for children it was kind of like a donahue format where kids spoke and the panelists were only referred to at some point you know and then many years later i was doing a talk show for ndtv called this delhi life and again i must have done maybe more than 250 wow. 300 talk shows Amazing. over the years right and it had reached a point and that's when i left meri baat because i'd done maybe 150 odd episodes and i reached a point where i wasn't even thinking right i would just reach the set and say aaj topic kya hai and you rattle it and out. then you know you just get on i just needed technical information what are the panelists names you know a little bit about them and what's the topic and that's it right um but then when this daily life came again lots of research lots of homework but again your 100 150 episodes in it had reached the point of saying a charge topic kya hai right and then i you know moved on and and then television itself at one point had started boring me so i said okay let's get into education and then i got into coaching and you know right. training then i had many multiple businesses that i ran shut and some did well some bombed learned over the years right. but but like right now penny has just <laughs> <laughs> Drop dropped deep. in my head thank you thank you so much <laughs> for that you know i can't tell you how grateful i am about yeah. the the thing that it is interesting till you have to figure it out yeah and then once you figure it out it's, it's then the, it's the same thing, thing. in life yeah. Yeah. and it works for some people the no, the, the because the knowing you, you, works for some that's people. right and i think human nature is about that because when you and also see pressures start building up you got quits education you're used to two vacation in a year you got to change your car you want to be on yeah. your holiday whatever it is so you know those expectations change in yourself so why would you kick a bucket which is flowing beautifully for yeah. you but if you are so passionate about something about your practice and you feel that hey if i don't change mm. so you know i look at let's say i mean there are a lot of people who do it uh, you know we only hear about the ones who are shining in the, the present limelight but let's say if you even look at the ones who are very established So you look at let's say somebody like um, uh, Satish Gujral, for mm. example. You know, art, start an artist, do your painting, do your mm. sculpture, and then you say, you know, let me try something else. Mm. And he goes goes and does architecture. You know what a shift it is, and he does a great job of it. You know, yeah. uh, so it's not about a great job or not. It is about taking that risk that yeah. you know I'm prepared to walk away from this, mm. and I'm gonna do something which is where my original journey started from. So to be able to start from scratch yeah. in a new space of course you never start from scratch because you have the experience of whatever you've done right. it it translates and it moves with you got it interesting <laughs> so you know you've done many things and if i can draw some parallels from my own life doing multiple things also means you've tried multiple things which then also means you've seen multiple levels of failure over the years right and how you dealt with and what do you think about failure because i think in today's day and age a lot of young people are scared to right. fail right. they just because we're all you know everybody gets medals in races you know nobody is allowed to come last yeah. uh, and we're inculcating that in our kids where they're not used to not getting a shiny medal at the end of the run whether they did well or not is irrelevant that's right and uh, i'm not passing any judgment on that but i just feel that maybe a lot of young people are not prepared to Yeah failure. exactly I think uh, when we talk about failure uh, like I said right in the beginning my own failures were really a good way to I think the more you more you fail the more you work work towards it to uh, fix it right yeah. uh, so let's say for example I would do uh, you know I mean I do a lot of mentorship with uh, young people and they come with uh, you know these pictures aren't working uh, my practice is not working I mean, you know, it's not some great philosophy. I'm saying we all know that we are blocking our ourselves. You stand in the way. You know, there is always. Yeah, yeah we are our biggest yeah? own yeah. obstacle. Exactly. Is just That's right. you yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is that uh, I'm, you know, my mother won't be very happy at times, so my accountant won't be happy at times. Hmm. I don't have plan B, and that's probably is the reason why you fail, and then you'll get on to the next thing. 
because you'll never, I mean, you know, everybody talks about it, right? That if you have a plan B, then there's no plan A then because you are so like, oh, if this doesn't work, I'll go there. Definitely you'll fail. <laughs> because, because you've got two goals now and you're <laughs> distracted. That's right. Yeah. And if you look at energies, then you're, it's almost yeah, like a self-fulfilling exactly. prophecy. Exactly. Saying, if this doesn't work, I've got that. That's and then, right. yeah. then, then so, they just yeah. So it doesn't work. Out. And also, I think because education... Uh, especially in our culture is really about performance based you know yeah. it's nothing to it's do not with it's not experiential yeah, no yeah. no it's not experiential so if you're not performing and how can you make fish climb a tree but mm. you know you got because that's the only way to look at it yeah. I think I did one uh, TEDx in Rajasthan over a very long time back and they were all kids coming from low income group they were coming from and parents weren't mm. really literate and all that and uh, it was uh, talking about a rat race and you know, all rats are running and you know, so the kids were really clapping away. And I said, and then when the race finished and there's a rat which got first prize mm. and everybody's the kids were clapping. So I said, but there's a problem there. And they were, so I said, well, there's still a rat, you know. So uh, the idea is that, you know, do you want to be part of that sheet or you want to go and do something else? And if you get caught up, which is what you spoke earlier about the noise part of it, that the, the trouble is that because it's such a judgmental world today, especially with their digital platforms. So I think we just have access to so much information that we didn't overly. have back then, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. W you know, who's gone on a holiday, who's got a new job, who's got a promotion, who's bought a new dress, Sorry. who's got a new house, who's got a new car, and you have access to so much about what people are doing that Sorry. it's very difficult yeah, to yeah. limit comparison. Who's got a new job? We don't know. Yeah. Who's gone on a holiday? We don't know. <laughs> you only knew about the four or five people you were in touch exactly. with and you didn't know yeah. about extended uh, social groups yeah. at all. And then we complain about privacy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we do live in a very voyeuristic world do, yeah. and we don't realize how voyeuristic we are. You know, right. we are... We used to complain that, uh, you know, the old auntie looks yeah. out of the curtain and is looking at my comings and goings. Ki right. bhai, you know, uh, dadi, auntie, nani, koi to parda khol ke right. dekh rahe hai, you know, uh, is spying on the me. Neighbors, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they were only spying on four houses. <laughs> Now we open it to the whole world. Now How many we're spying people are on, watching it? Yeah, now we're spying on a couple of thousand people parallelly. And it's not just the aunties. Yeah. It's kids from the age of 10, 12, 13. Now forget about spying. It's about you. We ourselves go and open it that how many people are looking, how many likes and how many followers. So you're actually telling that please spy. <laughs> I'm telling yeah, you all. No, I was off social media for many years. And last year I opened a new account because I felt I had something to say right. and uh, I think it's just because I had something to say I if I felt it could help people and now that I'm helping a few more people it's there's just a sense of satisfaction in that okay yeah. but uh, but it's a it's a tough call like if I had to do this 10 years ago I probably would have got suckered into the yeah. likes and right. the yeah. you know now I try to create a uh, create a wall right. and not get yeah so you know that brings me interest. to uh, i have uh, i was at some forum and in fact at the Pune design festival so there was somebody asked me that you know how do we deal with and they're all professional students faculty you know like how do we deal with the social media space and uh, you know so many people i know they have so many likes on so many followers all that see the reality the main piece people keep forgetting is uh, what you are doing mm. the noise is secondary uh, until, unless you are some influencer, it's all about that, yeah, which is correct, a different correct. space anyway. So I look at it as, as, as simple as that. So I, I talk about my own thing. I have Insta page, some 70,000 people following over the last 10, 12 years. I've been there for all that's a decade or whatever. Uh, they come to me, either I've interacted with them, they've been to my show or I've seen their work or whatever. You know, some or other level, uh, it's not knowing each person personally, but there's some kind of a connect there. They look at it and and they interact and i interact back and that's my so it is basically what you're doing is it's you your tribe know. you need to know yeah you need to know why you're there maybe you yeah know. no so this is your tribe yeah exactly why you're there this is your tribe these are the people who interact similar thinking and all that now if i want that hundred thousand two hundred thousand kind of hits you know that's different space you know you're a movie star right or wrong about it but you, yeah, you no, have but, to have a very different you have to have clarity about where you want to be yeah exactly and you know yeah, unless you're a rock star, that's I'm not interested if somebody likes my work sitting in Timber too. How does it matter to me? Yeah. What matters to me is people who are part of that tribe, you know, people who have similar thinking and obviously their critique, their you know, opposite views within that. And I think that is really should be the 
driving force about and to deal with the social media space because otherwise it can really bother you because yeah. especially yeah. for young people it's a very i mean i had so many young artists i meet they talk about uh, uh, you know that uh, my work is so good but you know i never know where to put we've it started um, valuing our worth on the basis of uh, that noise. Of, of that noise you Sorry. know and there are so many people whose work is good and maybe they're just not good marketeers or maybe they just haven't been seen enough or but i think we have to we also have to curate our social media experience for our own peace of mind mm -hmm. and mental health i think that's right yeah you know i've like i mute and unfollow people that <laughs> I don't work for me, you know, sure, and I yeah. think I think we have to curate that experience. And if you're conscious, social media can be a very powerful tool to impact change, you know. Well, that um, was the original word eh, before yeah. everything else took over. <laughs> yeah, true. No, because there's so many projects like GoFundMe and other yeah. things, and you know, uh, uh, platforms that are highlighting good news and uh, and I think so. It can be very empowering, and, and you just like any other thing in life, how is how do you how do you choose to bring that into your life? Right. Yeah. You know, on what on what uh, conditions yeah. do you choose to what bring that into what yes. lines you draw i think that makes a huge yeah, difference yeah, i want to talk about fear today after having experienced so many things are you still scared of something does something still scare you uh, i mean you know i think the fear is uh, for people who are close to you uh -huh. more than about your own fear of failure or whatever because uh, we are human beings, we go away. You know, my dad went away for, for three years back. Uh, I don't think I suffer from fear because that fear is connected to risk. And risk is, you know, going back to do you have plan A or B, you know, or two plans, three plans. Going on. So I, I don't think I've ever had, uh, uh, but I'm also, uh, be it personal life, be it friends, be it work, money, you know, and profession, whatever. I've been very much about uh, leap of faith mm -hmm. and uh, intuition is not so great with men. I don't think I have that. I'm being very stupid. I've had very big disasters. But, uh, you know, I keep looking at it as that I'm still standing and I'm doing better that when I didn't get into grade eight and I was told to go back, and go sit in that classroom or grade seven where all these kids, you know, at that level, I mean, today I talk to you so much younger to me, but, you know, when you are at that level, one year is a big gap, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they would Flunking look at me. a class can yeah, be very And they look at me and I'm like this tall, lanky kid in there. So, you know, that that's fear, humiliation, everything, failure, name it. And, you know, so each day I'm doing only better. You know, so if there are any way that, and it's not I think back of that day or whatever, mm. but subconscious is always there that it's, it's better because you made a choice that, you wanted to be a fashion photographer, you're doing great. And you said, I don't want to do this. I'm uh, doing publishing. I don't want, I want to work with NGOs. I don't want to do that. I want publishing. I don't want to. So, you know, you, are, you managed to leave those behind. Mm. And uh, I think the other thing with creative people, uh, you know, which I've also suffered is this whole carrying the archives of what you've done, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, like yeah. I've got these images and these books and I should put this into. Can I tell you something? I... I mean, we all like to, especially creative people, think that they're going to leave this legacy and all that. Nobody cares, you know. I mean, I was talking to some class I was in Boston and they were talking about this whole uh, Picasso. And I said, well, you know, I work in, I worked in Madhubani. Okay. I, I go and talk to those women there about okay. Picasso and they're like, who is Picasso? Do you know Madhubani? You don't write. So it's, we've got all our own little worlds. Yeah. We just become very about the self-importance that, listen, I'm going to create this piece of book or fashion piece of or food or whatever it is, it's going to be there. That's my legacy. Let me record, document, or social media, or blah, blah, whatever it is. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. <laughs> so is it easy to let go? Because you've done projects and this archiving is is a practical issue. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. It needs space, time, effort, right. energy, so much. And you've done projects around the world, uh, especially when you were running a corporate communications company out of Dubai. You yeah. You documented the Burj Khalifa from foundation to building. That's six years right. worth of footage. Right. So, um, well, it was given to the client and then the rest went wherever it went. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's see, go. Yeah, I mean, it provided me the money, mm. which made sure that I could fund projects, which I do on my art projects, personal projects. 
and uh, it gave me the expertise to and the challenge of going and doing something. I'd never worked on that. I developed the concept. The client took six months to sign up onto it, but once they did, you worked with everybody, right from Giorgio Armani coming into putting his first property there, or working in China where the cladding was done, or you know, aerial shoots, name it, you know, show in uh, in Manhattan at the Skyscraper Museum. So all these things were, they were just. Uh, I did and they were paying for it. So, I mean, what more do you want? <laughs> I know that kind of gave you the ability to do yeah. projects that were more meaningful as yeah, well. The freedom, You've done yeah. work for UN, for That's the Gates right. Foundation. Lots That's, of right. Stuff That's right. Well. And I think uh, there is nothing, I don't believe that you know, there is any job is, uh, you know, superior or inferior. Uh, it's your practice, it's your choice, it's your environment, it's your circumstances. And that's why we do it. And I think my, uh, which I keep saying is that the biggest thing in the world is uh, respecting people's individuality. If you apply that yeah. to any front, be it... Uh, but I think we're living in such a homogeneous world now. It's becoming more and more homogeneous. You know, where you could tell a tribe or a culture apart from their, from their dressing, from their speech, right. from their food. A lot of it is getting... Yeah, it's getting yeah, sort the, of yeah, the diluted a little bit. Global world, unfortunately, mm. and you know, it impacts. And that's why it goes back to the same thing people with not having that voice so where and you the put cultures are that? dying out yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are so many tribes and and communities where Endless, yeah. uh, where they've got an art or a craft skill which is on the verge of going away going too. away because there's nobody to encourage or create a space for that's them right. to to, right. yeah, to do yeah. something with it yeah that's sad but uh, in all of your doing of all of these many things it means that you've also seen failures of multiple kinds, financial, mental, emotional, right. which ones are the toughest to deal with? And how do you even deal with failure? How do you deal with failure? How did you deal with failure? Yeah, you know, well, I think the toughest ones are the personal ones, mm. uh, because uh, you invest yourself so much and uh, you're dealing with a person or mm. people or family or partner or whatever. Uh, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. As far as the professional one that you are bankrupt and you don't know where to get a client or what new practice to start, that's really the easy part you know, because you can you figure it out. You know, maybe not today, tomorrow, whatever, at least you're not on the street yet. So, uh, so dealing with the personal part, uh, you know, you look back, I think you, you compare yourself the miserable times you had before this and you say that, okay, man, you know, I swam through this. Yeah. So hopefully this, you know, will also I'll survive it, you know. Yeah, this and, too shall uh, pass. Yeah, so exactly. So that line of this too shall pass is something which I have to remind myself when I hit something really at the bottom. Uh -huh. uh, because it's difficult, uh, you know, but then as some friend of mine said that, you know, a heartbreak doesn't kill you, you know. So then you keep reminding yourself that, okay, I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, no, not yet, not yet. Exactly. Yeah, I know. I, I, I think I saw... Uh, it was Tom Hanks in some interview or something who said, you know, if you're going through a good time, it will pass. Right. If you're going through a bad time, yeah, don't bad. worry, it will pass. So, Both pass. Yeah. And uh, it's the ups and downs of life that make, That's right. so make you, it exciting. Yeah, so you bring the same thing into what we spoke earlier mm -hmm. about your practice you know, as a creative person. You know, that part. Yeah. That's what keeps you going. Because if it was... I come from a privileged space, I come from good education, All everything is provided mm. and I have this life. It's mm. like being a worm, you know, you're born and you produce and eat and then you're done. Uh, or do you want to be something where you keep hitting those highs and lows because when you hit the low and coming up is like, oh my God, this is getting great, you know, and then you get numbness there and you say, no, and I'm bored with this and then suddenly you fall in another hole. Now imagine that you can you can call it reinventing or whatever you know you had your own in your own life that you know imagine so many wavelengths or up and down in one single life oh my god it's the biggest blessing because who knows what's gonna be the last one in any case so you might as well go through as many processes as you can because uh, it's a blessing and I think it's a privilege and it's just being very special to be given that. Otherwise, most of the world, unfortunately, it's yeah, like it's like what I say about 99%, not exact number, but you know, people yeah. are depressed on a Sunday night because they got to go to a job on a Monday morning, but they are not, they cannot become a chemist because you're an architect and you cannot become a, you know, physicist because you know, you made those choices. 
but if you can go with these it's like being in a you know surfing basically you wait sure. for the wave you know, the right way yeah the adrenaline hits you different yeah <laughs> right. i completely buy that you know and i think when you said that if you there are certain privileges that we're born some of us have been given and education i think is one that there are so many people who still don't have that one basic right to education food a roof over your head things that we take for granted are things that are dreams yeah for so many around the world and if you've been given those basics you're already better off and exactly. it makes sense to live your life with a little bit of sense of adventure because you've already been given yeah. uh, you know a platform so don't don't feel bad about yeah. your life and yeah. don't feel bad about like oh god mai bechari you know <laughs> i'm struggling and it's in the struggling that you learn and you grow yeah, yeah. that's growth yeah that's growth you've been called a global nomad is that how you see yourself well i mean this covid kind of slowed it down but yeah i was doing <laughs> about uh, 250 to 300 days on the road travel every year what does that teach you about people oh uh, well teaching you many different things mm. i think going back to early reference i would say as a kid arriving into this my first international school in east africa on foothills of kilimanjaro boarding school and uh, you see all these kids who i couldn't even put a proper sentence in english and dealing with that uh, you felt insecure you felt really small you felt uh, you want even the color for that matter you were so marginalized i've never been with kids from the west and any other school before that mm-hmm. so i think and also i'm talking about the socialist india that time yeah. material was low we went from you know we lived in many different parts of the country but small town uh so i think for me it's really about uh uh the biggest uh, thing actually two things you really learn one is uh, your tolerance level mm-hmm. goes and, up yeah mm-hmm. and the other thing which is even even bigger is adaptability so whether it is food or whether it's uh, you know the means or whether the flights are delayed or whether or you don't get a hotel is. room or people trying name it i think mean, if you can go with those two things together uh, you survive it anywhere because it's, there's nothing there. you know people tell me oh, which is your favorite city do you like delhi but yeah, i don't like this and that. i'm like everything is the same it's just how do you see it you yeah. know you make your little life around it and rest is all you got to take it with a with a, with a smile basically you know? last question you have traversed the length and breadth of india of course the world as well but you have traveled extensively on various projects that you worked on you know whether it was on social impact projects or uh, documentaries that you did with your brother uh, you worked a lot and you documented a lot of work around the elderly right. what's the beauty that you got out of it because i'm sure there's a lot of sadness and work that needs to be done but maybe what's the one big takeaway you had from that entire journey of traveling yeah i think also that project was done during analog days i don't mean just camera wise but they weren't flies they weren't roads i mean what we have today was a difficult space getting caught in earthquake and bush and all that stuff so there were a lot of uh, uh the project was not about again it was about conflict so modernity we don't have state provide we don't have social security how old people are being marginalized nuclear families migration all that stuff so within that you pick up issues and then you the subjects were people who were who weren't down and out they were about productive aging people representing certain professions Uh, you know the chinese newspaper in the last chinese newspaper in calcutta we met the editor there or we worked uh, with uh, uh, with last dev dasi in uh, in puri uh, or working with uh, bismillah khan how he saw music or how kushwan singh wrote his stuff or uh, amrita pritam what she thought about you know so it was such a and you know i was i started that i was late 20s early 30s it took about 8 years photograph about 400 people all over the country uh, to me i think a very early start was uh, just to see what their perspective is it was very yeah. precious you know i mean it took me to talk all that stuff happened later on the book happened much later on even the book happened because 
all this work got together. We showed it, traveled around all the way to New Zealand to all kinds of places. And uh, we thought, let's make a book out of it. And I went to the publishers. Nobody was interested because typical distribution at that time. And I already worked on Jaipur and a bunch yeah. of books earlier. It was typical thing was that uh, give us a book on Agra or Delhi or whatever. But uh, who's going to buy something on old people, you know? So, uh, so decided let's publish it ourselves. You know, and I did that. Of course, most books were left in my parents' basement for you know, at least two decades. It's in fact, this year is 20 years when the book came out. But yeah, uh, I spent about eight years working on it. But the biggest takeaway was to, it's like you can fast forward your life, right? But you can't, you cannot go and sit what you'll be in your 80s. But imagine you hang out and meet people who are in those those times. Uh, there's always something to go back. And it's, it's not just some story about that, oh, we didn't have cars at that time. It's not necessarily just about that. So, meaningful. yeah, so they, uh, I think that a lot of them gave subconsciously a lot of layers in my head <laughs> what life is out there. No, I think uh, if in your 20s and 30s you can experience that kind of exposure to people above a certain age, I can't even imagine the life perspectives that got imbibed consciously or unconsciously. And uh, yeah, it's. It's it's quite beautiful. What's the best thing that you like in all of your travels and working with people from different walks of life? Yeah, I think, uh, and again, I'm not putting it as a challenge. Mm. Uh, the best part is uh, you're trying to figure it out. Yeah. You know, we had to figure out that we had to go 30 years back to some village outside Manali. We had little scribbles and maps and asking some guy on the road. You know, ah, there's no GPS. Google Maps. Yeah. Yeah, no so, Google you know, remember, so it was such a, you know, we got delayed by two hours. We got there, sunset, and there's no food there. But, you know, but it was that whole sense of discovery, which is what human beings are all about. But, you know, that, that business of, it's like music. I remember my best part was what? You were driving in the car and it's like, you know, that certain tune of Pink Floyd you want to hear. You go home. And you pull out that CD or tape and you play it. It's like, ah, oh, this is great. Now I can, then you could have, you know, this major music you carry in your pocket. Yeah. Now it's on cloud. You can do any, you know, it takes it away. Yeah. I think the problem is that, you know, the minute you are given too many choices and they're right in front of you, it's a very boring life. You know, uh, you go to new places, you meet people, you know, you don't be stupid about it, get killed or something. But I think uh, it, it, each time, the discovery, the difficulty. I go to Afghanistan, I don't speak Farsi, I don't speak Pashtun. You know, I'm sitting with them, they're trying to tell me something, I'm trying to tell something to them. It feels like I'm a little kid who couldn't speak. Well, I don't remember when I was that little because you know, obviously not, yeah. but trying to express something which you I'm looking for. You feel like a yeah. kid. And it's like, uh, so each time it's like uh, a discovery about your own limitations, which unfortunately there's nobody to checkmate because we don't checkmate our limitations. We just think that, oh, I'm king of the world. This should be all. Yeah, I think there's also a sense of uh, entitlement that yeah. is coming because of that, True. because of that, because you don't see your own boundaries. You feel... That's right. You know, it's yeah, all yeah. meant to come to me and I don't need to work to, <laughs> I don't need to work for it. Yeah. But if you had to leave young people, and since you work a lot with young people, if you had to leave young people, or maybe just people with a message basis, your own experience of life and living, what would that be? I think, uh, easy said, but it is really about risk taking. Mm. That's the most, and why you can take risks? Because you're young. Yeah. You know, when you're 40 and 50 or 60 or whatever it is, your risk level will keep dropping. Yeah, you can't sometimes financially take those risks because you have responsibility. Sometimes your health doesn't allow you to take certain choices. That's yeah. right. And, uh, and the key role, unfortunately, parents play a big part in there because their fear of giving that security, their fear of you should study this because they think, obviously, trying to make sure that safety is there. But that safety, what it does, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that safety takes away the risk and it takes away the hunger and then when things are not working out then you are complaining or you're upset and give you know, up yeah yeah and you give up exactly exactly yeah. so i think you know it's it's uh risk taking is the key to it and you can start it at whatever level it is mm -hmm. give it a bash what's the worst thing can happen you still have another 50 years to live after this you know yeah. so it's not like you can't fix these things so until unless you know and who knows who's going to be around 50 years from now in any case yeah. you know? No, I think you're an embodiment of that because if on paper I had to see failed class seven and to the life that you've created, uh, no parent could have 
yeah. you know, <laughs> written it and planned it for you. And yeah. I think it's in the failures and in the risk taking that you've created the life that you had and you're truly making a difference in the world. Thank you so oh. much, Summer, for being with us here on this show today. Thanks a lot. That's all on this episode. We'll catch you on another one soon.